Welcome everyone to this 2020 virtual National March for Life kickoff event, the first of many movie nights where we will be screening a one-time free screening of the documentary Strings Attached with filmmaker Obyanuju Ikiocha. Thank you so much for joining us. We have never ever done anything like this before. It's all a learning experience. Today is just the first of many online events that will be happening this week on marchforlife.ca. We hope that you will continue to stick around for the whole week, to join us, and of course to attend and participate in, from your own homes, in the virtual March and Rally on May the 14th. We have a lineup of wonderful speakers, guests, some special appearances throughout the week from political, religious, pro-life leaders from Canada and really from around the world. We hope that this March for Life week will really encourage you and inspire you to take action, to stand up for life. Even with this ongoing health crisis pandemic that's really locked down most of the world, abortions are still being done. They are still being committed. Babies are still being killed in their mother's wombs and people at the end of their life are being euthanized. So as a pro-life movement, even though we are locked down in self-isolation, we need to continue being a voice for the voiceless. We need to continue spreading the truth. And we need to continue to be not afraid. With that said, let's get started. Earlier this week, I had a chance to sit down over Skype to chat with our special guest, Obinuju Kiocha. Here's how it went. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. We have a very special guest. Uh, she is the founder of Culture of Life Africa. She's a biomedical scientist. She's a pro-life activist. She travels around the world exposing the lies of the abortion industry. She is an author and she is also a filmmaker and producer of her latest documentary film, Strings Attached. Obyanuji Kiocha, thank you for joining us today for this film festival as part of the Virtual National March for Life 2020. Thanks, Ma. Thanks for having me. I'm quite grateful to be part of uh, the event this year. Everybody knows that I'm a, a good friend to the Canadian pro-life movement as I've been to Canada a number of times thanks to the Campaign Life Coalition, but I'm very happy to be part of things this year. Yes, yeah, so we're very happy to have you. And uh, in this new format, uh, we can't march this year uh, in Ottawa due to the ongoing health crisis but we are taking on the march to the internet. It is a completely new strategy for us, especially for those with, who, who have known Camping Life for many years, the old guard, I guess. Um, so this is a new way of doing things, but we're excited and we're looking forward to watching this documentary, which I think is really um, so needed in today's world because there are so many things that people just don't know and don't understand uh, about when it comes to abortion funding. Um, before we jump into, before we dive into a discussion surrounding the movie, uh, let's watch the trailer. How about that? Sure, let's go for it. I would like to tell you a story, a story about a people constantly discussed by the world's elite but whose voices are so rarely heard. This is a story about how the people of Africa are being ideologically colonized in the 21st century. I'm pleased to announce that the government of Canada will be investing $650 million in sexual and reproductive health programs for women over a period of three years. So what I'd like to announce today is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation will be increasing our family and uh, planning investment by a new $560 million commitment between now and 2020. So I pledge tonight an additional 15 million euros. The UK government has always, at least over the past 20 years or so, pushed funding for so-called reproductive health, for population reduction measures and for family planning. The UK in the last five years has spent 163 million on um, reproductive health care in the developing world. I'm angry and I'm shocked at the world's elite ignorance. I'm just wondering why somebody would be so concerned with um, the affairs of another nation 
especially when it comes to issues of abortion. Shortly, I found myself in a, on an operation table. Mm. About 20 minutes, my baby was gone. We have seen women cry and weep and wail and groan. Surely, is that development? My family was affected too. That is not fair. In all this talk about contraception, the one thing that I have never heard of is something like the side effects of contraception. No one ever tells the African women. I think they should really know that they are hurting others. They are destroying Africa. They are destroying us. All right, well, you will get a chance to watch the full documentary soon. But first, let's have a chat with uh, our guest, Obin Uju Kiocha. Uju, this film it came out uh, about a year and a half ago, to two years. Since right. then, it has been shown in various parliaments around the world. It was screened at the Canadian Parliament two years ago. It's uh, entered several film festivals. It's uh, been selected, it has three official selections, two awards. It's been screened at an event at the United Nations. Yeah. It's been screened in the Ugandan parliament. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have watched this film, and yet so many people still have not watched this film. So we want as many people to watch it, but we want the decision makers, the politicians, those people who, who have the power to create change to watch this film. That's right. That's right, Matt. You see, because um, even at here in the United Kingdom, it was uh, screened at the House of Commons, which was um, quite a, a big move because anybody who knows how the UK works, um, it's not a very pro-life country as far as the government and the parliament is concerned, but it was even screened right there and parts of it was screened at the White House as well. We, we have managed to get this film in front of many, many uh, decision makers, but um, my true desire is that it be put before uh, the pro the, the pro life movement, the grassroots pro life movement, particularly um, those in Western countries who need to find out exactly what happens, um, which you know, which we expose a lot of in screens attached. So, Uju, why why did you make this film? This film about African stories, a film about African women their struggles, their pains, and their cries. Why did you make this film? Yeah, so for the last uh, seven years, Matt, as you had alluded to earlier, I have had the great privilege, and now I know it's a privilege because being in this pandemic now and none of us can travel, I now know for sure it's been a privilege to travel to many countries. I have gone to about 24 different countries in the last seven years, about 70 cities in the last seven years. Uh, many of those countries and many of those cities are indeed African countries. I've been to many communities across various regions um, on the African continent. And the one thing that kept coming up was just me encountering a lot of these women in the cities, in the villages, no matter where I went, um, telling me about their experience, their encounter with a, West, a particular Western organization. In fact, there are various Western uh, reproductive rights groups, so to say, uh, organizations like International Planned Parenthood Federation, IPAS, and the, the organization that I zeroed in on in this particular documentary, Marie Stokes International, uh, that go through different African countries. They uh, meet women, especially women at the lowest echelons of society. Then they try to sell to them this new, and when I say sell, I don't mean for money. They really try to push on them um, this whole ideology that is coming from the West, the you know population control, and they try to sterilize women. They are pushing abortion on them, um, even in countries where abortion is not legal. So when whichever country I went to, women, you know, I'd meet some women whose lives have been touched or changed dramatically because of the encounter with this organization and like you know like-minded organizations so it had happened for a number of years and then one day i just decided to ask one of the women would you be ready to to tell your story on camera for the world to know because um it's one thing for somebody to pay their taxes 
uh, in a Western country, but do you know how that tax money is really being used in the African villages thousands and thousands of miles away from you? Most people don't. And meanwhile, also, on the other hand, in African villages, most of these women don't even understand that the money that is changing their lives, the money that is strengthening these organizations that are changing their lives, is coming from you know some city or some big country or some wealthy country in the West. So I asked, would you be willing to tell your story? And uh, I asked one woman and then two and then three and several, and most of them to be you know quite surprising to me, agreed to to speak that they you know their about their stories and their experiences. So that was how I got a, a film crew, and then we went to particularly two different countries where it was possible for me to do at the time. Time, and we sat down with many women uh, and recorded their stories. And, and in fact, we also were able to get the, the you know, the side of the doctor. So, do the, you know, the stories of a particular doctor in a Ugandan village, but everyone will have to see the film to see the rest of it. That's right. And why, why do you think it's so important to, have to share these, these stories, not from, you know, not from someone, uh, a pro-life activist, let's say, in North America or in Canada, I mean, I could read the stats, I could read the facts, and I could talk about them. Yes. But why is it so important that the, the lived experience of these women who live in those villages, live in the rural parts of the continent, in various countries, why is it so valuable to the discussion that we hear their voices and not the voices of someone like myself or someone else in Canada, for example? Yeah, because uh, the lived experience is usually much more potent than whatever anybody can throw at you. You can, you know, one can bring up any number of stats or, or research or poll that has been done. That's all well and good. But when you take the camera and uh, you take it behind the curtain into the homes of people, into the lives of people, and you hear the, the side of the story of the people who are experiencing this at uh, the day-to-day, -day, the quotidian level, that is much more potent. And that is something that I find is most effective wherever I have gone, you know, to talk about Africa. It's easy for me to go around and talk about Africa. I am African, so it comes easy, right? But still, no matter how many anecdotes I can tell people or how many experiences I can share with people of my growing up in Nigeria and this, that, and the other, uh, people still feel better if they can hear it directly from the people that I am speaking about. So. I have done a lot of speaking about Africa at different forums and at different places and at different settings, uh, but I still want to bring my African brothers and sisters to let their voices be heard, because I think the world deserves to hear uh, what exactly is going on directly from the people. And uh, on the other side as well, I do believe that the Africans um, need their voices amplified because in, in, in many of these African societies, they are living these experiences, they are as pro-life as we are, but the only limitation they have is that they don't have some of the means uh, by which we use in the West to make our voices heard. Some of them cannot just go on Facebook and do a Facebook Live or whatever. Um, but I am so grateful that through this particular documentary, Strings Attached, I have been able to at least bring some of their voices uh, to the international stage. So I think it's important uh, more and more that Africans should be strengthened um, to, to speak their stories and to share their stories uh, with everybody else in the world. Yeah, and I know that uh, you've been involved at the United Nations for many years now, and that's actually where we met for the first time. That's and right. one thing that we often talk about is you have all these Western diplomats and ambassadors and government officials talking about Africa. It's almost as if they are obsessed about Africa, but not for the right reasons, <laughs> right? They want to implement their own value system, their own set of code of ethics if you even can call it that onto other people and one thing that i think is fascinating is that whenever they have these side events or these high level panels about the african continent or the africans in whatever region you always see the person from sweden there a person from canada there you know you see someone from the uk rarely do you see someone from that particular African village or that particular African city where, you know, the whole topic is the issue is being discussed about. So the fact that this film showcases those women, 
that one doctor, there are other individuals who are interviewed in this documentary. These are their stories. They're the ones speaking to the United Nations, to the whole world, saying, this is what happened to me. And no you know, diplomat or government official from Canada or Sweden, yeah. with all their fancy stats and words and, and scripts, can ever trump what my lived experience was. That's, right. like, that's how it should be. And that's yet, for some strange reason, these, their voices continue to be ignored by the, by the international community. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Why? Why is, what causes this, this, why are they ignoring their voices? Yeah, so Matt, in fact, you were with me on the very day, I think it was four years ago, when I was making a presentation at a side event at the United Nations in one of the conference halls. You were there on that day when a Danish member of parliament challenged me, an African woman, about uh, the, I was talking about maternal health and how the Africans do not want abortion, the majority of the people anyway, and how money should be spent instead on the maternal health care system. And this Danish parliamentarian then picks up the microphone and she says she's been to, you know, Zambia and Zimbabwe and Tanzania. She lists all these African countries. Um, the one thing I need people to understand is this. Uh, it is true on the international stage, a lot of people who are maybe from Western countries come out and they give in these big presentations on Africa, like this woman, uh, the Danish woman who had the opportunity to pick up a microphone. Uh, meanwhile, a Nigerian parliamentarian is nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, a Zimbabwean parliamentarian is nowhere to be found. They are in their home countries. If I wasn't there on that day, it could have just been her and the rest of the people who have come from Western countries. It could have been her against you, for example, you who are from Canada. And so because she claimed to have, and most possibly have traveled through African countries, um, you could have been, you know, anyone could have been intimidated by that. Any product person who hasn't gone to all these places, you, you will calm down because what she was trying to say is that even though she's, you know, she's from, you know, she's Danish, she had gone through all these African countries. But the reality that people have to understand is that it is true that a lot of Western uh, politicians and members of parliament and people serving within different Western governments, they do come to Africa. We see them. Uh, the last time I was in Ethiopia, I was staying in a hotel in Addis Ababa, and there were hardly any Africans staying at this uh, hotel. There were mostly uh, Western people. So these people actually do come to our capitals. They do rent hotels. They do rent big jeeps, and they go through the city. But let me tell you the people who speak to them. They go in, and they speak to our presidents. They speak to our um, health ministers. They are protected 24-7 uh, by maybe 10 uh, security people. Nobody in the actual world has had access to them. When I was in Nigeria, I was in Nigeria until I finished university and I was working. Not one single day did I get an opportunity to speak to a Canadian official who is visiting Africa. What we hear on the news is that some Canadian minister came, but we just see them on the news. So they're so far removed from the real situation of the people. Um, they don't, they, they, people are not given access to them. Yes, for security reasons. But what I'm trying to say in essence is that what they then do is they take their, their story of having visited Africa to the United Nations and other international forums, and they say, yeah, because we've done this, we know. And this is our idea that abortion should be made legal because, you know, we've gone through Nigeria and we've gone through Ghana, and this is, this is how it should be. Um, so it, it is something quite interesting to see how it all plays out. Uh, but it's something that is ongoing and it's happening more and more. In fact, it's uh, minus the pandemic that has happened and the lockdown. We are having more and more Western officials going into African countries, be it, it representing their countries, as well as uh, organizations, you know, wealthy Western organizations. They are coming in more and more into our our countries as as travel international travel becomes easier they are being called stakeholders in some african gatherings especially among our of our own african officials they are calling western organizations stakeholders why are they stakeholders in african countries and why are they being invited to the table where policy is being made within the context of africa 
uh, you know, we, within our own systems, if we're having a very important high level uh, health meeting or policy meeting in Nigeria, for example, you it would be quite easy and common to see someone from the European Union at that table. And that should not be so because we have to know as Africans that a lot of these uh, Western people in charge, the people right at the very top of things, many of them uh, have been ideologically tainted. They already have their own ideas and ideology about sexual morality, about abortion, for example, about the life, you know, what when is when does life begin and, and so on and so forth. So they should not be given a, a table, you know, they should not, not be given a seat at our table. Yes. So in a way, this film is almost a response to that. This yes. is a film about real African stories. Yes. You can't tell us what to do. That's right. You can't tell us what we want and what we need. We are going to tell you what we want and what we need. And yeah, to, to actually, to, to, al to alleviate people from poverty, to, yes. to help educate them and, and so on. Yes. So neocolonialism is what we, um, a lot of people have termed it and I have spoken about neocolonialism in the last uh, couple of years now. I've written about it um, in my book, can Target I just, Africa. Can, Drew, can I just quickly do this? That's yep. it. <laughs> That's I have spoken about it. You can get this online. Just Google it. Yes, it's on Amazon. So it's quite easy to uh, publish by Ignatius Press. So I wrote about neocolonialism in uh, Target Africa, and I have spoken about it at, at various forums as well. Um, but it is just this phenomenon and concept of um, what I've just talked about. It's Western uh, entities and Western leaders and some, you know, Western organizations coming in to decide for Africa uh, and Africans what is best for us. It's a kind of paternalism which we have not solicited for. Um, it is them just ignoring completely everything that we are asking for on the one hand and trying to enforce upon us um, what it is that is their ideas and their own ideals and ideologies. And before we get to the movie, one final question, Uju. What has been... I guess the response from this film you you've showcased it all around the world what has been the response okay matt so obviously um the a lot of the places where it's been screened where i've been present is at those parliaments that we talked about and at those various events at different places and for the most part um the response has been quite overwhelmingly positive because again what can one say to an African woman who is crying because her life has been dis destroyed uh, by an abortion she got at a Western organization that is in the, her, her capital or, or her, her town or her city, right? So, but I found um, going to parliaments, various Western parliaments in the first place um, to screen this documentary that it has been an eye opener for many Western uh, members of parliament and people who work around them to see how bad things really are. Because a lot of people, especially pro-life politicians who are in the West, um, even though they're pro-life, a lot of them are quite focused on what is going on around them, rightly so. They are focused on the issue if you're a Canadian pro-life um, you know, member of parliament or politician, you are very much focused on, on the problem in Canada. But many of them don't actually see how the international issue concerns um, their country. So showing it in Western countries has been great response because now pro-life uh, members of parliament and people around them, their minds have been broadened and many of them are now more interested in speaking up for life wherever it is, but also to ensure that their country is not a part of the problem, that their country is not inadvertently funding uh, the killing of unborn babies in countries far away, because a lot of these projects happen where they happen but they're not being well publicized and in you know there's kind of a a, a a complete chasm in between so those who are in africa aborting babies and uh, they're there and those who are doing the funding are on the other side and they they usually do not communicate but those who are the engineers of it do know and that's why the style is like that and then i have shown it of course in african uh, setting as well when i showed it at the ugandan parliament 
um, there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of anger within, uh, I found the kind of uh, the Ugandan parliament where the Ugandan MPs were um, very upset and unhappy because not even one of them, there were several MPs there on that day and they all said they had absolutely no idea. Of course, our own politicians do know that Africa and African nations are recipients. We are, in fact, a major recipients of donor funding. Um, that's one thing that doesn't surprise anybody. But one thing that they don't understand is how much of that money goes into the pockets of people who then come in and promote abortion and other things that are objectionable to African governments. So they were saying that they were going to fight it at their own level. Um, it was also screened at a a major university in Uganda, this was the uh, Uganda Christian University. Actually, this was the last screening that I attended before the shutdown. So it's only about three months ago that I, I went there to screen the documentary. And the, it was an incredible response among the students um, at this university. In fact, on that day after the screening, the students were so eager to do something um, from their own level because they too had no idea about what was going on. They know what abortion is, they know that people are trying to push abortion on them, but they had no idea how, you know, how organized it is as the film exposed. Um, that on that day, in fact, they started talking about starting a right to life group on campus, which they didn't have up to that point because abortion is not even legal in Uganda and a lot of places in Africa, you know, across the African continent, we don't have legal abortion. So the, I think the, the, that's a fantastic thing. But you see, the, the, another side of it, the, other, the flip side, is that because we don't have legal, uh, legalized abortion, we don't have a lot of groups, as you have a lot of pro-life groups in Canada and the United Kingdom and the United States. Um, our campuses don't have organized pro-life um, right to life or students uh, pro-life groups or students for life groups. So on that day, I saw them talking about it. And that was really for me, that was, I, I, thought, I think I shed some tears because they were asking me, tell me how we're going to do this. And we were already discussing it before the shutdown. And I'm hoping and praying that by the end of this year, or before the end of this year, they will have a good right to life group on campus. No, that's awesome. These are some of the fruits, the many fruits of, of your labor, really, because you've been you've worked so hard to get this movie Thank produced you. and created. Thank you. And, Thank and, you. That, and I had a lot of help. I had a lot of help from good people. <laughs> that's right. Um, the one thing I'm just going to close on this um, one last question. You know, you, you, we often talk about this movie being good for pro-lifers so that they could be educated on what's really happening. But the truth is, we want this movie to be seen by people who aren't necessarily, you know, pro-life or we want, we want people who are maybe indifferent, who never really thought about this yes. to watch this film, because this film, you've done your research and it highlights where the money comes from. It talks about the stats yes. in addition to the personal stories. So I think people who watch this film, your eyes will be open to the reality of how, like what you said, of how organized this abortion industry is when it comes to implementing their strategies per se yes. on the uh, on the African continent and really throughout the whole developing world that's so true i think this movie is um, it's a godsend uju thank you so much uh, before we cut to the movie i know everyone is probably very excited to watch this film strings attached where can people uh, perhaps download it purchase it and where can they get more information about the movie Right, Strings Attached is available actually on Amazon Prime. So if you have Amazon.com, you can go to Amazon.com and you can uh, download it. But then I know people have complained when they're not in the United States or United Kingdom, it might not be that easy. So you can also get it from Vimeo On Demand. Um, but then if all else fails, uh, you can go to the website. There is a website, it's www.stringsattachedfilm.com. Dot com and I'm sure perhaps you can share that as well um, in, yeah. in various places and media that you're going to use uh, for for promoting the March for Life and for promoting this uh, night screening. Uh, but it's stringsattachedfilm.com. So if you go there, you can click on how to watch it, and it, it will give you actual links um, to the places where you can you're able to to stream it or watch it from. Perfect. Uju, any final remarks before we cut to the film? 
Um, it's just to encourage everyone. Uh, this is this is the March for Life week um, that people be strengthened by your um, convictions that we are supporting life. We are uh, speaking up for life of the unborn. You are doing it as Canadians. I just want you to know that you're not alone. Even if you feel perhaps like a bit of a minority in your country, um, when you watch Strings Attached, you will see that many people around the world think exactly the same way as you do about their unborn children, about women uh, and pregnant mothers. Uh, be encouraged, be encouraged, be encouraged, and never stop speaking up for the unborn because we are on the right side of history. Thank you so much, Uju, for joining us. Thank you.